You're watching the Ed Reach Network. Welcome to the Google Educast, presented by the EdReach Network, giving educators a voice, a big voice. You've reached episode 72 for November 15th, 2012. This is the show where we talk about educational applications for Google products, including news, tools, tips and tricks, and classroom applications. I'll be your host, and this week we have an awesome group, starting with... Fred Delventhal. And Juan De Luca. Beautiful. And good to see you guys. Good and, to see you. Yeah, likewise. Uh, let's see. This is kind of new. EdReach appreciates your support. One of the ways you can continue to support us is by rating us on iTunes. If you go to the edreach.us slash network and find your favorite shows, or for this show, simply go to our channel page at edreach.us slash channel slash Google Educlia and click on the iTunes link. A little iTunes love goes a long way. So, thanks for your support. So, segment one, what's new with Google? And first question we have is, what do you think of the new layout of Google Search? That came up in the GCT group earlier this week. And there was some bantering about. What did you guys think? Um... Well, I, I like the fact that you can you can search by by size, by uh, emails larger than a certain size, um, or older than a few months or a year. So so that's kind of neat. Easier to find your your stuff. Um, uh, when I put this in, I was talking about the Google search page itself. Oh, you're right. And you know now they've got. They've taken away the left sidebar, which a lot of us have been teaching for a long time. Yeah. And now we have up at the top, it's web images is all up there, and then you have this more button if you want to do more, or then you have the search tools, and that gives you where um, any time and stuff. So it's not really any more clicks. It's just laid out differently. And... Same thing with the images. If you go to the images, and um, then if you want to do the search tools for search by color or anything like that, then it um, shows that's where you can do the color and do that kind of stuff. So it's just it's just laid out differently, and I was just was wondering, you know. Um, what do you think? I, I've heard some complaints from people because people don't like change. All right. Yeah, I think I jumped to the next section about <laughs> the new update in, in Gmail. But, um, yeah, I, I think it confused me at first because I didn't, I didn't realize where, where things were. But it's just like if you're living in Google land, then you know that things are going to change from one day to the next or from one hour to the next. And to me, they, they didn't add any features. Well, I, I haven't found uh, any new features. Um, but it's, it's elegant. It, it looks nice. I'm it like, added more white space to the search screen, which is kind of cool. And yeah. It, it took... It took a little while to discover, like you were saying, all those tools are there and they're nested, which is kind of cool. But um, it, and if it, you think uh, about it, they were nested before, though, because you'd have to click on the More button for those options to show up anyway. Yeah, but it makes sense because it's more like Gmail now where links and stuff aren't there until you need to use them. Mm-hmm. And when you need to go to something, you you mouse over it, and that's when the tool or the drop down or whatever appears. So I mean, it it makes sense to do it. It's just kind of shocking that it's like one day you go to your search page and it's like, oh, yeah. Now, have you do you see it everywhere you go, or I mean, when I first started to see it, I would see it on one computer, 
using Chrome, and then I'd switch over to Firefox and it wouldn't be there, and then I'd come home and on Chrome it wouldn't be there, but then in Firefox it would be. And now I think it's pretty consistent across all my things. It's sort of their whole rollout, however that goes, or as the cache gets older or something like that. Do you see it everywhere? Not at all at the same time. Never. I, I now see it everywhere. But I, I think you posted something in Google Plus maybe a couple weeks ago or a week ago saying that the layout had changed or somebody. Yeah. I think it was right. When it did, I took a screenshot right away because I didn't know <laughs> what was going on. How long is this going to last? Huh? You didn't know how long is this going to last? <laughs> right, exactly, because things could change just like the you know the black toolbar and stuff too. Right. So I just thought, I mean, Fred always gets things early. Um, <laughs> we, all, <laughs> we all know that. We all know that about him. <laughs> Um, so yeah I know and and I guess it makes sense the the order from top to bottom that you search for something and then you you decide if you want to filter and then you get your your search results instead of up left right now it's from the top to the bottom I guess it makes some sense yeah yeah all right all right so there's also some new ways to get stuff done in Drive. And Fred, did you drop that in? Yeah. This is sort of a, um aggregated post because they've been rolling some of this stuff out uh, as they went along. And um, I didn't know this, really. I mean, uh, for some of my teachers that have switched to Drive now and they lost a lot of the documents that had been shared with them, this first thing, search by person, is definitely going to help them out because if you can't remember the name of the file or any of the words or that are in it, but you remember the name of the person that uh, sent it to you or shared it with you, you can search by that name and then the documents will be able to come up that way. Hey, Fred. Also, yep. Uh, I've got a question. I don't know how much you played around with that, but if I'm working in a group and let's say that three of us are working on a project and I can't remember whether it was you or Juan that shared it with me, but it was shared with all three of us. Could I look it up by either one of your names? I do not know. Hmm. We may have to try that out. That would be kind of cool. I mean, it, you should be able to because Juan's name would be attached to it as well, right? It would be the, right. using tags, basically. But Right. Yeah, uh, I don't know. If you take it literally, it says can't remember can't remember the name of the of the file, but you know who shared it with you. Now Drive can search autocompletes uh, people's names, making it easier to find the stuff you're looking for. So if you take it literally, it's only the the person who shared it with you, apparently. But I think we should try it out. Yeah. Um, another thing that they added was you can view Google Earth map files now. You can um, preview those and work with them, interact with them a little bit with KML and KMZ files. Um, you can now create new folders in the window that you are organizing with. So that was something new. I know I a couple times I... Um, wanted to organize something, I went in and remembered, oh no, I have to create the folder first. So I backed out, created the folder, then it showed up in the thing. Now you can do that right within the organization window, so that's cool. And then we talked about this a few weeks ago where um, they added, uh, um, you could almost always upload files individually or as a group of dragging and dropping files into the Chrome window to upload them to Drive, but uh, you can now upload a whole folder. Just drag the folder over to the Chrome window and it'll upload to your Drive. And search includes your trash. Yeah. So. And I just, I just did a quick test, and it only searches the owner. Okay. So, so if you remember who the owner is, not all the contributors or editors. Yeah. Mm. That's too bad because that would be kind of nice because a lot of times working on group projects, I can't remember who created yeah. it but shared it with everybody. So right. 
Uh, maybe in the future, be, right? For sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, next, uh, looking for ways to make it faster and easier for you to find your messages using search in Gmail. So starting today, which I think was actually yesterday, you can now search emails by size, more flexible date options, exact match, and more. Yeah. And I'm trying to find where that post is. But um, one, you were talking about that earlier, so. Yeah. Okay, so I'll share. Yeah, okay. Can you see my, my screen? Yeah, perfect. Sure okay. Um, I haven't tried it out yet, but there's uh, some very simple ways to, to search for uh, for an email depending on the size of, a, of an attachment or um, based on, on date. So sometimes if you're looking for very old emails, you have to go back and back and back uh, a few times. But now if you only want to look for an email that you know they sent you over a year ago, then, then you type older uh, than one year ago. So, so um, I, I, I don't know if you probably have to learn these, <laughs> but sort of like the file type and all, all those. But it, yeah. it's good to have them. Mm -hmm. When I first saw that, I was thinking, you know, um, just the operators don't necessarily follow what I'm used to, it seems. I was trying to think about, okay, if I normally want to search for a file that's larger than something else, it, mm -hmm. it size, colon, 5 megabytes or 5M, I mean, it's not even 5 MB, which I would normally think of. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just by doing that, it searches for anything greater than that. But we have a greater than symbol. Is it that they don't think that people understand which way the greater than should work or that it only <laughs> works one way? You can't find all the files smaller than 5 megabytes. And I don't know why anybody would want to search for that, but you know, it just seems like the operators are kind of obscure. That's true. And along those same lines, when I saw it, I was thinking that, like, really for most people, it trying to learn, like, file greater colon underscore greater than 5M and, you know, when right there you've got, like, you can go in and from the pull-down menu fill in all those operators basically from a form, which, yeah. I'll be honest, that's the way I'd do it. I'd, I want to be like, um, let's yeah. see, if I create this query using... Yeah. So, but, I don't know, it's, I mean, it's good to have it there, but um, I just, I don't know how much use the average user is going to get out of it. Yeah, you can search for, for emails that have attachment but not necessarily based on the size. So, but maybe, like you said, those operators could be there. Maybe there could be some, some basic search and then some, some pullout for more advanced search. Like has attachment, but something underneath attachments between one and five meg megabytes or whatever. That'd be kind of nice. Have like radio buttons that you could click. Yeah. And then, Fred, that would be the same, like kind of like what you were saying, 1 to 5, 5 to 10. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, have either of you heard about the Healthy Buildings Initiative? Um, just from the show notes. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm, I, I kind of <laughs> preach that Google doesn't do enough to out when they're doing good stuff. Um, and I think this is one of the cases. Um, so they, uh, they awarded a $3 million grant to the Green Building Council here in the United States. So uh, basically the premise is, you know how like everything is labeled on the side of a can of raviolis or whatever you buy at the store? Mm -hmm. your, your bag of Fritos or whatever? Um, well, taking that 
taking that idea and applying it to buildings and kind of being clear about what materials were used to construct it, what milled materials are in it, um, and kind of moving towards that Green Council idea of like let's make buildings healthy so that we have healthier people and all of that, healthier environment. Yeah. So I mean I guess nationwide a three million dollar grant isn't going to go that far but I think it's definitely a step in the right direction and and a cool thing to do. I mean I think they're taking the lead on this and that should be recognized. I get it. Lead? Oh, you're the man. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure. But, so mm. I just, I, you know, I like to plug when Google does good, so that's my, my pitch for tonight. Fair enough. Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, three million doesn't sound like much, but it's, it's not. It's not going towards building. Uh, yeah, it's going towards awareness. Exactly, and making like standards that people can understand and follow for for those buildings. So, and it's yeah. definitely a start. So, I mean, it's all good. Well, and that's the organization that helps building figure out what they can do to be better at being yeah. greener. So mm -hmm. I think um, since they're a nonprofit, every little bit seems to help. And so it allows them to reach out to more um, architects and so mm -hmm. on to um, ask for their resources or help in terms of those businesses that are building a new building and are designing, they want to design with the environment in mind, so um, more power to them and more money from Google. So <laughs> all good. Yep. Well, speaking of good things from Google, I think Juan actually beat both of us, Fred, to the announcement today of uh, Google Plus for K twelve app schools. Yeah, I put it in the show notes. Um, I think it's it's a very big deal. <laughs> We've been waiting for this for a, for a long time, and suddenly it just hits us because some of us were expecting it before, or we were hearing some tentative uh, release dates, and then I just uh, sort of like maybe forgot about it a bit, trying to to find workarounds and other things uh, teachers could be doing. And suddenly, it hits you, and I don't know what to do now. <laughs> but it's amazing. It's awesome. It's huge. I mean, I, and it's kind of interesting because my experience with it today was I was talking to somebody, and I was like, dude, can you believe this? And they're like, isn't that, you know, the social network? And, and I'm like, well, yeah, there is that aspect of it, but that's cool for kids. But I, I was thinking even larger, there's this opportunity for students to be um, having hangouts like we are and collaborating and sharing docs and doing all the great things that we do every week. Uh, it's just another avenue, right? I mean, I've been kind of running one of my university classes at using Google Plus almost basically as an LMS with, you mm -hmm. know, minus a grading struct or a grade book. But... Um, just dabbling with that. So, like, thinking about unleashing that on, you know, younger students and being able to build foster collaboration and all that stuff. What do you think, Fred? Are you sold on it or are you worried about it? Or Well, they, they say it's Google Plus for K-12. And tell me if you've ever seen a 13-year-old kindergartner. No. Right. So it's really Google Plus for um, what ninth, eighth graders on up, because do they still have the um, limitation that you have to be thirteen plus in order to get on Google Plus? Well, they should be thirteen plus to have an email account, but with Google Apps, they can start using email earlier than that, depending on when you turn it on for your domain, for your users. I'm talking about Google+. Plus. 
<laughs> do the same. Do the same rules apply? I mean, you know, I I look at it. I'm in an elementary school, and everybody's going, "Oh wow, Google Plus, Google Plus," and I'm like, oh, oh, "No Google Plus <laughs> for us." So, well, I think that's the domain administrator's decision. I mean, that's where I was going with that because just as the domain administrator takes on responsibility for email accounts and stuff, why wouldn't that hold true for Google Plus? Well, since it's a premium, you have the the terms of service for almost each one of the premium services. It doesn't necessarily, I mean, Google passes it on to the school district to abide by um, whatever laws and stuff, but I wonder, you know, can we turn this on? And again, they're only able to talk with people in our domain, but does that mean that we have to sort of come up with a new configuration so that we don't, I mean, I guess I'm jumping to the bad conclusion. Sure. Of, that's why you've got the job you've got. Well, I mean, <laughs> of uh, you know, high school students having a hangout and having a second grader stumble on, into it um, because they see, oh, a hangout started um, well, and, here at this high school. And I, and I I see what you're saying and I get it, but I think there's also whenever somebody who's not in your circles joins the hangout, you get a big fat warning about it. Okay. And you if decide... That, well, well, no, I mean, I, I, I'm asking that's you that's guys. That. You guys are my experts that I go to, so... Well, I don't think anyone's an expert because they just announced this, like, five right. hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, it's going to be, like, another service that you can you can put kids under a sub-organization and uh, enable it for those over 13 and turn it off. Well, it, it's going to be off and by, I haven't, by default. And I haven't looked at it in the dashboard to see, like, how granular it is. Can you turn on, you know, Google Plus as the social side of it for, you know, this user group and turn on Plus with Hangouts for this user group and, you know, like, how much control you have over it. So I don't know. I mean, with this whole conversation could be for not... Right. And again, a lot of our stuff, because they have it so locked down where I am, you know, people, nobody can share outside of our domain. So it's not like I would ever see um, our kids being able to um, do a hangout with kids in a school in Mexico City. But I can see the value I mean, of how cool it would be for your third grade kids to be having a hangout with other third grade kids that are in the same class or maybe no. in the other third grade class but it's a grade, le it's a grade level as part of your you know, RTI or your PLC or whatever alphabet soup you want to choose that <laughs> everybody's doing the same, same project so that these kids can collaborate outside of school and hang out but they're still all in the same domain, right? All right. I mean, I I see that with the kids being out of school, but our school's so small. Get up and walk over next to the to the next door classroom. You know, don't go and use this. Just and that would that would be just awesome, <laughs> fantastic nineteenth century little house on the prairie skills. Oh, stop! <laughs> but I I seriously, over to the if, they're, if they're door. Google Play, if they're hanging out with the kids in this in the classroom next door. They can wait until recess or something like that. So um, now maybe school, other schools in the district or something. But even then, I I would much rather have our kids um, interacting with students at a di in a different state even, and then um, just within the same kind of. Uh, I want them to learn something new. And not rehash everything that they well, so everybody you, does in our state. This is my last little poke, and then I'm, I'm gonna. 
leave you be. But so, how are the, how are our second and third graders going to learn how to behave in a hangout and how to deal with students from an, uh, somewhere else in the state or somewhere else in the country or Mexico City or something? When do they just suddenly get that knowledge when they turn thirteen? I mean, like when the kids turn eighteen, you throw them the car keys and say, "Good luck, buddy." I mean, what? You got to start somewhere, right? But well, but see, yeah. then this is my thing of. Um, I would much rather teach them in a real world sense of hanging out with another classroom, uh, not in our school, but in Oregon, in Mexico City, in Germany, or something like that. With your kids. What? <laughs> the state of Oregon, I will find a teacher to hang out with your students. Yeah, but we don't have Google. Yeah. We'll probably not get Google Plus, Google Hangouts for uh, or Google Plus for our kids anytime soon. So that's the problem. But and I, you know, we don't have a test track where every parent can go and take their kids and teach them how to cross the street. <laughs> I mean, there isn't there isn't a walled off place that okay now we're gonna wait for the fake car to go by and then do that. They do it in the real world. And why do we have to create these walled gardens, to use the catchphrase or the buzzword, um, with technology and email and all these other things where they're emailing the person that they just saw out at recess? Fair enough. <laughs> to wrap this up on a on a bright note that I think we can all agree on. Yeah. It's kind of nice that now we can have fifteen people in a hangout instead of ten. Yeah. Did you just catch that part of the note. Uh, yeah. So now, is that is that across the board or just in the Google Plus for education? And across business? the board. I think I it was across the board because they announced it on the Enterprise blog. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, I have a higher ed domain. If you want to see how how it looks from a domain side, I'm sure it looks now the same in a K to twelve. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, why don't you have Google Wallet turned on? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, I don't know if it works outside of the US, but I have most services on, the ones I can, and this is Google Plus. Um, so you can turn it off, uh, it'll be off by, by default, you can turn it on, and then you have the choice for configure premium features. And if you click that, it'll take you here, and this is where you can, users can restrict sharing of posts within the domain, um, if they're restricted by default, uh, you can control whether Hangouts on air are allowed. So, um, and here are here are more more questions and answers. So, with the premium, and now uh, for free through, it'll be for free to the end of 2013. So you can try it out for for at least a year. We don't know if it's going to continue being free for education after that. Uh, but but yes, you can restrict Hangouts to your organization only. So that'll solve most of the problems. Yeah. Very good. Okay, uh, Fred, tell me about uh, Meograph. Okay. Um, this also came up in one of the discussions, I guess, and somebody was looking at how to do a timeline, mm -hmm. and then our own Diane Maine answered back, well, what about doing a tour in um, Google Earth? It would be geography-based or whatever. And that reminded me of Meograph, which I had seen several weeks ago. And Meograph, let me switch back here and... So for people watching that can't see it, it's kind of funny because all of our cursors are on the same link right now in the show notes. <laughs> so Meograph uh, lets you create stories that are based on Google Earth. 
And so if you were telling your life story, you could say, I was born on this date it, in this town, and then when I was three on this date, we moved in this year, we moved to this city, and this is where I got my first kiss, um, and then this is where I went to college. I mean, you can just create stories, and it will jump around the globe, and for each pinpoint that you put on the map, you can add pictures, you can add a YouTube video, or anything, and, you know, this was my favorite song in high school, that kind of stuff. So it's just a neat way to create sort of a story or a timeline using uh, Google Earth. That is really cool. So, um, and so we will put a link in there in our show notes. That's really cool. I missed it. <laughs> okay. I'll have to click on the link later. <laughs> It'll be in the show notes. Okay. <laughs> Oh. Uh, now it's time for discussion, so you could probably, um, if you can multitask, look that up and discuss at the same time, but <laughs> the discussion is if Google Instant <laughs> is slowing people down, <laughs> so how would Instant Search slow you down? I guess we've got to define our terms first, right? Right. Instant Search is, if you're using Chrome, uh, it could be the Omnibox where you start to type and it will start offering you suggestions. Or if you're on the Google search page and you're typing in your search terms and it will start dropping down a list of most commonly searched for combinations for you so that you could um, easily select one of those and click them. And So that's all good. Right. I think that that's great when you want to use it, but what I find in working with people and trying to teach them some things, um, I will tell people specific things to type into their address bar or into the Google search box, and they will type two or three letters and only have, or they'll, they'll start typing the word that I'll tell them. They'll only have a couple more letters to type, but then they'll stop, and their hand will go to their mouse, and then they'll start looking in the list to find what they're going to click on to finish those last two letters. And don't that, they know to me, they're just a certified search expert, and they should just listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's not just about searching; it's about even addresses now and stuff. It seems to be infiltrating. Um, just what uh, common sense I don't know if that's um, too strong of a word to use that if you just have a little bit more to type just continue typing it and you'll have it and you'll be that much faster on your way so what do you guys think do you see this same thing happening or I am I the only one I think you know, you, you struck on something there where a lot of people don't realize it's like explaining keystrokes or, or keyboard shortcuts mm -hmm. where you're like, you know, if you do it this way, you know, use this keyboard shortcut, it's going to, you don't have to reach over and, touch, you know, grab the mouse and click. And pe people who don't spend as much time at a keyboard as we do, I guess, don't really see that as a benefit. They're like, well, it only takes a second. Dude, <laughs> a second, you could be doing something better. Yeah. Um, I, I, I feel like some people see the list, and if they're searching for something that's not on the list, their search is not valid for some, for some reason. And I've seen it in, in other places. So, so it's like they're searching, and these are the options you can search for. Don't try to search ah, for yeah. anything else. And, and I think some people, um, some people think like that, that those are the options, so they have to wait for one of the options to come out. Or start backspacing because their option isn't there. So uh -huh. Yeah. So, so it, it is making them slower. Uh, and I think, you know, another thing that's been happening to me is I don't, like, when I want to stop short of what the predictive text comes up with, because I only want to search the first, like, three words of a four-word term that the predictive text has, you know, come up with, and I, and I press enter, 
um, I get the results for the full four words, even though I didn't type that last word in. Yeah, I get the same thing, and it, it's frustrating. Or it will randomly choose something in the drop-down list. Yeah. Where I wasn't even anywhere near that with the cursor, and a totally different word that it thought I meant came up, not misspelled or anything. It was just... it. So, I mean, it's That's quirky. Good. Go ahead. But what do... what I mean, any suggestions as to of educating people or... I don't want to say change them. How do we change them? But how do you change them? <laughs> well, I think you go with your, your first idea is by educating them and say, you know what, it's... Mm -hmm. Hold on a second. What you know, and I, I think that's something. As teachers, we all know is good, is to say, you know what? Stop, stop the lesson right here, and let's talk about what's going on. <laughs> Teachable <laughs> moment. Yeah. But but then when it comes to practice, I know I'm guilty of being like, I'm in the middle of the thing, and we've got 15 minutes left, and we're doing it, and we're going, and and you know, and and so that teachable moment may not happen today and it may not happen tomorrow or whatever, but I think it's it's worthy to stop and say, okay, you know what, uh, this is what I saw, this is why I think it happened, let's talk about it and let's talk about a better way of doing things. And let, you know, uh, you definitely have the knowledge, Fred, where you can you can say, like, you know, look, this is, you know, it's demonstrable that this is going to be a better way of doing things and here's my reasoning and here's my rationale and if you choose to keep doing it your way, there's nothing I can do. But let's talk about it, and let's let me try and help you and educate you, and then we'll, you know, and then from there, it's kind of up to them. Yeah, is, is my take on things. You know, I if, if I stop everything and explain and and give you cause, and you still don't want to do it, then <laughs> you know. Can't help you there. Yeah, but I I tried so. It's like the um, what was it? The number one thing that people search for on Google is how to get to Google. Yeah, they and search for the must, word Google. How much uh, they that must drive them crazy at Google as to how do we stop people from just doing that? And you know, teaching them about the OmniBox. Well, on I Chrome. Had a, I was in a workshop earlier this week where I was. Some people were typing, and we, they were really good. They were typing directly into the Omnibox, but they were typing this, like, HTTP. <laughs> I'm like, mm. you don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Just, like, skip all that stuff and get to the good stuff and start typing there, and they're like, ah, no, no, you got to type this. <laughs> well, and that gets back to even um, we have a very memorable, easy app, the whole universe. What are they and <laughs> so if I if you go to it, um, you can up in the upper left hand corner. I didn't see this right away, but there's a tour and it tells you a little bit about. It. And so uh, it's really nice because it starts off giving you a sense of where everything was. It would take an 18 years for a jet plane to reach the sun from Earth. Did you and guys hear that? That was like third grade teachers everywhere being really excited. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's it's just a really kind of amazing um, way to show the universe and give a sort of a uh, aspect of scale. And let me stop the tour real quick. And so it on any of the stars that are in the universe or whatever that are near like Sirius you can click on it and up will, it will zoom in well it didn't that time is that where you get your satellite radio from <laughs> <laughs> if we zoom back in and click on Sirius you get street view right <laughs> wow it's I guess it doesn't like me um, broadcasting it and trying to show it at the same time. But when you do that on any of the galaxies well, it, or... Um, it looked like there was a little um, encyclopedia entry, entry that showed up on the left for just right. a Right. And 
it will show that it will show you the star and then give you um, the information about it so it's just a, a really neat informative thing and then on the right hand side you do have the familiar slider bar that you can um, zoom in and out. zoom in and zoom out of the galaxy that kind of thing so wow. uh, let's see pretty awesome and yeah. you can even drag to rotate it so that you can I mean since it doesn't really have an up or a down but um, so if you teach astronomy or space or anything like that it's a great tool to bring into the classroom and either go through a tour or um, have the kids explore that's very cool. And to follow up on Juan's question, when is Street View coming? <laughs> I would guess uh, next year. <laughs> yeah, it's really no. It is awesome. You're you're using a Mac, right? Because it, the, I mean, it looked very very smooth. Um, and but so I, it, it works really well in Chrome. I did not try it in any of the other. Um, uh, browsers or anything, but I would think that if it's HTML5, then it would work in Firefox as well. Yeah, very nice. So speaking of Chrome and Mac and all that, um, they are starting to play nice with Chrome and um, Flash. Um, I don't know how much. Get out! I know. <laughs> Crazy, right? Like, finally. So, um, you know this this brief post, which was, I mean, it's, geez, three hundred words maybe, but um, even though they're explaining how, even though Adobe Flash is used everywhere, it's also commonly used as a vector for malware, which is why Chrome has been kind of the anti. Flash, but uh, and I didn't know this. The last couple of years, Google's been working with Adobe to kind of figure out how to take the best of Flash and let it work, so that in the Chrome browser there can still be that security layer, but um, all the goodness of Flash Player. So I was ridiculously happy to see this when it was posted yesterday or day before. Yeah. So. To attest that it's it runs inside a sandbox inside Chrome, so so that makes it more more secure, and it's coming. It's coming to Windows and Linux later on. Ah, it's oh I no, didn't, it's I didn't read that far down. I was like, no, but I know it's it's saying that it's everywhere now. I think Apple. I think Mac was the last yeah. one to get it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so um, kind of a small thing, real, but kind of a large thing too. Because I mean, like everything runs Flash, and having it stall out in your when you're using Chrome was just incredibly frustrating. So I'm looking forward to enjoying that um, that they finally figured it out and things are playing together nicely. Yeah. Good. And so that brings us to segment four: the classroom application which is our fellow Google certified teacher, John Miller. This was posted, and I feel kind of bad about it, because this was posted back in October, and somehow I didn't even notice it. If you don't know John, he does a lot of really great things with his kids, and um, he's had them blogging and doing all kinds of good stuff in his classroom for years, and actually if you want to get your students blogging, he has a great like um, boot camp. I think it's right there, the blogging boot camp up here, where he has basically the lesson plans for the first couple of weeks of school to like how to structure them so that you can get your kids blogging and doing these great things. Um, but I thought this was a pretty cool idea. Google Drawing, do you guys use Drawing much? I did. Uh, I uh, actually used it today. I needed to draw out a diagram how tables were supposed to be set up for a meeting for the custodians because it was going to be a new setup. And so 
the easiest way for me to do a diagram of how the table should be set up was Google Drawing. And yeah, so, drawing is pretty powerful, uh, and it's kind of, for me at least, kind of kind of underused. But um, in the for this part of the year, John's having the kids; they're researching middle medieval history. So um, he had the the students um, work on three unique sandwiches <laughs> that they described in their blog post. But um, they used Google Drawing to create an illustration to go along with their description of the sandwich and the construction process. And, and I just thought, um, unfortunately, it looks like Flash and my version of Chrome aren't playing well together right now. Did you click on the title of the post? Yeah, that does it. No, oh, that does do it. Awesome. So thanks, Brad. So um, you can see that the students were, I mean, this is a pretty rich um, process that they're going through. They're using, they're blogging, they're descriptive writing, they're diagramming. Um, I mean, it's pretty awesome, man. All of these, again, with you know, free tools that he's pulling off the internet through Google. And um, Excellent. I just thought, it, I was yeah. like, that's pretty awesome. I mean, that's... Yeah. Now, what grade does he teach? Seventh grade. Okay. No, he's like fourth or fifth. I'm not sure. I thought. Okay. Really? And everything was done in in drawing. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. That's okay. really cool. Yeah. So isn't that pretty awesome? The carne asada sandwich there. Uh, Getting and hungry. Daisy's yummy sandwich. <laughs> And it's interesting to see the um, different ways that each student approached it, too. Yeah. It wasn't so strict. It was op sort of open-ended to letting them figure out what to do. So Yeah, how they wanted to build it. And uh, I just, well, I found this today, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is fantastic. You need to get some recognition. Yeah, very nice. So, and we're coming to the end of the show, which is uh, for shout-outs and feedback, and the only shout-outs I have is from <laughs> Fred, Fred Delventhal. Oh, you guys Mobile. didn't know. <laughs> and if you're not familiar with Movember, there's a new <laughs> so Maybe, Fred, you could explain that caterpillar on your lip. <laughs> Uh, Movember is where um, men grow facial hair that normally don't have facial hair to bring attention to uh, cancers that normally afflict men. And they, November's some people use this. Prostate Cancer Awareness Month? or Yep, and that men also get breast cancer and so on. So some guys will use it as a fundraiser. I'm not sure quite how that works, like how long, you know, 10 cents an inch or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, so, uh, and then that's when all the um, beard and mustache competitions heat up and so on. So um, just uh, I decided that I would... Uh, since I've had a beard and and goatee before for a while, I haven't had a mustache since I think I was 21 or 22. So a um, couple of years ago. Yeah, and so I um, grew it, and all these people at work, even though there are we have other men in our building, and they have beards and mustaches. Um, it seems like everybody seems to be noticing mine, and they've <laughs> never heard of Movember, so. Um, I guess it's working. It's doing it. Uh, it's bringing attention to it. So, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So um, that'll do it for this week on the Google Educast. A uh, big thanks to the crew, Juan and Fred. Um, and of course, you can find the usual gang of suspects on Twitter. Fred, where do we find you? You can find me on Google Plus. I am Plus Fred Delventhal. The only one with a vanity URL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, can we find you? Bad. Just Google me. 
at Wanda Luca. Very sure. nice. Well, Twitter is at Mr. Wanda Luca and Wanda Luca on Google Plus. Yeah. Very good. And I'm at Shawnee on Twitter, and that's um, or G plus dot to slash Shawnee, and you'll get to my Google Plus page that that way as well. Um, then hey, why not follow at Ed Reach Us on Twitter at, as well, and do make sure to subscribe to the Ed Reach Weekly Newsletter and pass it on. You can do that at edreach.us slash newsletter. These are great ways to get the latest blog posts, podcasts, and news coming out of the EdReach network. Thanks again for joining us. Continue the conversation at the EdReach network, and we'll see you next week. See you. Take care, guys. Thanks, everybody. You're watching the EdReach network.